my honor and uh, pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Professor Ahmed Gul, who is professor of rheumatology at Istanbul University. His main interest is um, immunopathogenesis and genetic of Bajet disease and FMF and other auto-inflammatory diseases. He has um, uh, over 150 publications with more than 6,500 citations. The floor is yours, Professor Ahmed Gul. He will speak about update on Bajet disease. Well, dear chairpersons, dear colleagues, First, thank you very much for the kind invitation. Shukran jazilan ala daveti. Assalamu alaikum. Innahu sharafun azizun. Well, that's all I can say in Arabic, and I have to continue in, in English. Well, in my talk, I will. Shukran. I will briefly discuss the original definition of the disease and the diagnostic challenges. And also, I will uh, review with you the recent ULR recommendations on the treatment of Bechet's disease. As you know, the disease was first described by Hulusi Bechet. He was a dermatologist in 1937, based on his observations in three patients with recurrent oral after ulcers, genital ulcers, and uveitis. And he also even discussed the possibility of a viral etiology, mainly because of the distinct features, especially uh, in, in uveitis, you observed in those patients. And you also mentioned that in some patients, treating oral cavity infections prevented the recurrences. So the infections, viral and bacterial infections, were considered originally as triggers of the disease manifestations. And most of these manifestations are recurrent. And they are healing by themselves. Uh, so they are self-limited without any scar, such as oral ulcers or gentle ulcers. But some of them may leave a scar, such as uveitis, vascular manifestations, or neurologic manifestations. But they all are recurrent, and they all are self-limited. And although it is known as a single disease, there are different subsets of uh, manifestations, especially there are some patients with only mucocutaneous manifestations, such as oral and genital ulcers and erythema nodosum. There are some patients with popular postular skin lesions and arthritis and enthesitis. And another subset is uveitis, ocular manifestations. And the fourth one would be vascular manifestations, especially uh, venous involvement, dural sinus thrombosis, superficial and deep vein thrombosis. And it is running a much more severe course in young males, and there is an increased mortality for neurologic and vascular manifestations. And as I mentioned, it is a systemic disease, and there are different manifestations. And for making a diagnosis, we really need the combination. But what is the right combination? We are usually using classification criteria for clinical studies, but it was uh, usually accepted as a diagnostic criteria, especially the international study group criteria, which is the most commonly used one, is actually the oldest one, uh, is requiring oral aftus ulcers as a sine qua non manifestation. So if you don't have oral ulcers, you cannot use ISG criteria. And just because of this, another group developed a new set, but for this new set, presence of oral and gentle ulcers are enough to make diagnosis of Bechet's disease. They all have problems, especially um, the possibility of classifying some overlap, overlapping conditions are, are really quite high if the patients are suffering only from mucocutaneous manifestations. So there is a circular problem uh, in the development of these criteria. If we start with the classical manifestations, especially mucocutaneous manifestations, I have to mention you that in about 15 to 20 percent of patients at the beginning of the disease, there is no oral ulcers. So if you will use only the ISG criteria from the beginning, you will lose at least 20 percent of patients who will not develop oral ulcers in the beginning. They may start with vascular manifestations or uveitis or even neurologic manifestations may be the initial finding. And another issue is the definition of bipolar aftosis, which 
uh, could be the sign for the classification of the disease in the second new criteria. Well, we have to uh, remember that there are a group of conditions which can develop bipolar aptosis, oral and gentle ulcers. Of course, Peche's disease is an important uh, condition causing bipolar aptosis, but Magic syndrome, Crohn's disease, Sweet syndrome, erythema multiforme, melanoid kinase disease, which is another auto-inflammatory condition, or recently described haplotype insufficiency for A20, immunodeficiencies, viral infections, drug eruptions, and especially now we have another condition, especially quite common in Western world, idiopathic complex aptosis. So those individuals will not develop any other manifestations, and they are not BHS. But unfortunately, most of them are diagnosed as BHS and treated as BHS patients. So what happened in the original definition of the disease was uh, BHS, BHS himself observed uveitis. And interestingly, the same patient was seen by another critical ophthalmologist, Professor Fuchs, of Austria, who, who actually described Fuchs uveitis. So he saw the, the same patient, and he described the case as, okay, this is somehow a unique case. It must be something oriental. He didn't see any similar patient. So it is a unique feature. So the presence of these typical manifestations are critical for the definition of the disease. For that reason, bipolar uh, bilateral posterior or pan uveitis is the most distinctive feature of the disease, although in some patients you can see some anterior segment involvement with hypopion, but it's usually the continuation of the posterior segment involvement, vitritis with typical precipitates, retinitis attacks, and especially capillary leakage, diffuse capillary leakage with some non-perfusion areas are defining typical classical Betches uveitis. And for an experienced ophthalmologist, they can easily say that, okay, this is Betches uveitis, and it is different from other sources of uveitis. Quite similarly, there are some additional typical manifestations that we want to see along with mucocutaneous manifestations, such as typical parenchymal neurologic manifestations affecting mainly brainstem or vascular involvement. Skin pathology tests, may be another supporting finding, although it can be seen quite rarely in sweet syndrome or pyoderma gangrenosum, but the, in the right clinical setting, it is very helpful to confirm the diagnosis. But many other manifestations, such as gastrointestinal manifestations or arthritis, are uh, seen in other conditions, and they are not distinctive features of the disease. If we will focus on vasculitis of Bechet's disease, it's been classified as variable vessel vasculitis because of its distinctive features. As you know, we are using a scheme to classify our systemic vasculitis uh, based on the type of vessels and the size of vessels, starting from large arteries to, to medium-sized vessels and, and small vessels. But for Bechet's disease, it is really necessary to remember that it is mainly affecting the venous side. So the venous side involvement is much more critical than the arterial involvement, and we have to change the picture in this way. So we have to add large veins to the clinical spectrum, and we have to mention that the venous side uh, involving uh, vena cava superior, vena cava inferior, dural sinus thrombosis, deep vein thrombosis, are actually happening much more frequently than the arterials. And when the arteries are involved, it's usually aneurysms formation. Pseudoaneurysms are quite common in the course of Bechet's disease. And it is the only disease covering the whole spectrum. So Bechet's vasculitis can affect all types and all sizes of blood vessels. And, and the veins, again, the much more important. And it is a vasculopathy with mixed cellular infiltrations. And especially, there is a tendency for thrombosis and pseudoaneurysms and perianeurysmal uh, inflammation are causing a lot of problems, and it is very destructive, especially the inflammatory reaction around the vessels uh, are, are quite destructive. You can see this is the abdominal aortic aneurysm, it's pseudoaneurysm, so the whole area is the aneurysm, actually, and you can see the destruction of the vertebral bodies. 
It's happening in the, the bronchus uh, of lungs, so that's the main reason of the pulmonary arterial uh, aneurysms and fatal bleeding because of the destructive changes which is causing uh, the bleeding through the bronchus. And it is quite inflammatory, and, and these thrombotic events are very uniquely sticky and very hard, so there is no risk of thromboembolism. This is very important features of the VHS disease. It is sticky to the vessel wall, and we don't see thromboembolism in those individuals. So this is one of the endarterectory material. When you try to take out the thrombus, it is quite hard. You have to change, you have to uh, use all the endothelium, and when you remove it, it is very hard, rock hard, and it is different from all types of thrombus. And the third distinctive feature is neurologic involvement. It typically causes subacute brainstem syndrome with focal or multifocal inflammatory lesions, mainly affecting the brainstem and diencephalon, uh, causing pyramidal signs, ataxia, hemiparesis. And when you investigate CSF, you, you can see pleocytosis, elevated protein levels, and IL-6. And another group of patients may develop vascular manifestations, dural sinus thrombosis, which is actually a milder form, do respond to treatment very well, and it's different from the parenchymal patients. So these are the distinctive features of the disease, and they all are associated with a hyperinflammatory response. And this hyperinflammatory response mainly involves innate immunity with nonspecific hyperreactivity, such as we see in pathology reaction, and it is not unique to skin, if you use needle prick to any other area, you can induce a similar reaction. For example, this lady is developing recurrent oral ulcers because of this tooth problem. And if you prick the arteries, you can induce arterial aneurysms. If you prick the veins, you can induce venous thrombosis. And it's a neutrophil-rich inflammation associated with increased neutrophil activity. But we can also see adaptive immune system activation with mainly Th1, but also TH17 type of polarization. But these adaptive responses can be triggered by anything, and it's not unique to our self-antigens. Especially viruses have been studied a lot, starting with Hulusi Bechet himself, especially Korean colleagues investigated herpes simplex virus, and they even developed an animal model called ICR model, but it is not a Bechet's model, it is herpes simplex virus model with typical herpes manifestations. And this uh, picture is coming from Julius Bechet's original paper, but also bacterial infections, especially streptococcal infections are quite critical. And if you use patients' own saliva with the streptococcal antigens, you can induce a very strong inflammatory response. And if you use streptococcal antigens to trigger patients using streptococcal injections or even pneumococcal vaccination can cause exacerbations. And this hyperinflammatory response is strongly associated with a genetic background. And we have families with strong familial aggregation and family history can be seen in about 18% of our patients. And the lambda S value was calculated many years ago between 11 to 52, which is quite high for a complex disease. And second clue for genetic contribution is coming from its geographic distribution. This is a disease of this land. It is quite common in the eastern Mediterranean countries, and it's going along the Silk Road up to China, Korea, and Japan, but the highest prevalence rate is reported from this region and which is reaching up to four in a thousand in Turkey, which is actually the highest prevalence rate. And the disease has been associated with an HLA molecule, HLA class one molecule. Originally, B51 association was described by Japanese ophthalmologist Professor Ono in 1973, but it is still the strongest genetic factor associated with the disease. And if we investigate why B51 is causing the disease, it is really an interesting story because B51 is one of the oldest HLA molecules known in the history. It is actually a Neanderthal HLA molecule, so it is an archaic HLA molecule. And if you look at the distribution of HLA B51, it is overlapping with the distribution of HS disease. So it is quite common in the Eastern Mediterranean countries 
and it's going along the Silk Road and going again up to uh, Japan, which is overlapping exactly with the distribution of the disease. So B51 is possibly defining the phenotype. And if you look at the another archaic HLA molecule, HLA C16, which is weakly associated with Bechet's disease, it is not the same picture. So B51 is playing the major role. As a class one molecule, B51 can either present certain peptides to cytotoxic T cells. So far, we don't know any peptide specific for Bechet's disease. Or as a class one molecule, what it is BW4 epitope, it can interact with NK cell or receptors expressed on NK cells, cytotoxic T cells, or or gamma delta T cells. However, the third option might be folding problems. Very similar to HLA B27 story, B51 is one of the slow folding proteins. And for a proper folding, it needs proper peptides. If the combination of peptide and HLA molecule is not correct, there is a problem of improper folding or, or unfolded protein response, which cause endoplasmic reticulum stress and activation of innate immune system. But for both folding problems and cytotoxic T cell response, we need peptides. And the peptide link uh, sold with the GWAS study. During the second phase of our GWAS study, uh, which was conducted at the NIH with our colleagues, uh, Dan Kastner's lab, with Elaine Remmers and, and Yohei Kirner and colleagues, we identified HLA in B, HLA B51 patients only the association of ERAP1. So there is a strong association of ERAP1, only those individuals positive for HLA B51. And if you look at the, the usage of this uh, ERAP1 molecule, it, which is an endoplasmic reticulum aminopeptidase. And usually we uh, process all of our proteins within ours, uh, within the cytosol, so any peptide derived from our own proteins or any cytosolic proteins are processed in cytosol by proteasome or immunoproteasome. But when they enter into endoplasmic reticulum, they should be digested further by a Pac-Man. So it's very similar to Pac-Man. ERAP1 is digesting them from the amino terminal until they reach to eight, nine, or 10 amino acid line. So when they reach to certain level, they are ready for uh, loading on the HLA molecule. And if the peptide and HLA is okay, the result is the, the proper expression of HLA molecule on the cell surface. However, we know that in HLA-B51 positive individuals, they, if they carry haplotype 10, and depending on the certain polymorphisms, they have functional problems. So if they are carrying haplotype 10 homozygously, the peptidome they produce is not appropriate for HLA-B51 molecule. And it is a different story for ankylosing spondylitis and psoriasis. For example, haplotype 1 and 3 are associated with ankylosing spondylitis if they are B27 positive or associated with psoriasis if they are HLA-CO6 positive. So we have now a new concept, which was developed by ourselves and Dennis McGonagall, which, who, who were here, I, I believe, yesterday, uh, the MHC1 opathy. So we have HLA class one molecule associated diseases. Depending on your HLA combination, and depending on, again, the peptidome produced by ERAP1, the combination is causing, if it is B27 and ERAP1, haplotype 1 and 3, ankylosing spondylitis, if it is haplotype 10 and B51, Bechet's disease. So the, the puzzle is started to be solved. So we have several different genetic polymorphisms determining the clinical phenotype, but the most important one is, again, I say B51, which is defining the phenotype. On the other hand, I have to remind you that it is not a diagnostic test. For example, in Turkey, 29% of healthy population is B51 positive. So we cannot use it as a diagnostic test. So even here in Jordan, I know about 16% of healthy population is B51 positive. It doesn't mean anything. If you don't have additional ERAP1 polymorphisms plus some additional polymorphisms, it, it means nothing. It is a common allele, and it is not a diagnostic test. 
So we need some additional polymorphisms uh, sen determining the sensing and processing of pathogens and danger-associated signals. So they are de determining uh, the, the triggering events. And many other polymorphisms, such as uh, the lack of IL-10 or increased expression of IL-23R, STAT4, IL-12A, and, and several new polymorphisms, such as RIP kinase, LAC1, they all are, again, defining the inflammatory phenotype they are developing. And when we investigate these polymorphisms, it overlaps enormously with spondylar arthritis, especially Crohn's disease. And there are some overlaps with leprosy tendency as well, but they all affecting our innate immunity, adaptive immunity, and the activation of endothelial cells. So at the end, we need environmental triggers, which was recognized originally by Bechet himself. And depending on the genetic background, B51 plus many other polymorphisms, uh, the patients are producing a hyperinflammatory response. And this response is involving both innate and adaptive immunity and also causing an endothelial activation. And among the clinical manifestations, there are several, several manifestations which can be seen in many other conditions. But only those with typical distinctive features are ocular, vascular, and neurologic manifestations. So without these distinctive manifestations, it can be anything. And we are using this data to generate targeted treatments for the treatment of our patients. And if we start with the infectious etiology, oral hygiene is, is quite important because oral cavity infections are causing uh, several problems. So a better oral hygiene is always associated with better patient care. So uh, we are focusing a lot on the oral cavity infections. And also physical and psychological stress are triggering most of the disease manifestations. So the patient education, psychological support, and, and better care are also quite helpful. But regarding the drug treatment, uh, we have now updated recommendations. But within these updated uh, recommendations, it's better to start with the overarching principles. First of all, it is a disease associated with relapsing and remitting disease course, which means that the, most of the manifestations are self-limited. So with or without treatment, they heal. But for certain manifestations, manifestations, immediate treatment is important to prevent tissue damage. So it is not a critical issue for oral ulcers, but for the treatment of ocular or vascular manifestations, we need immediate treatment to prevent organ damage. And also it is necessary to remember that most of these manifestations are getting milder and milder with the passage of time. So when the patients get older, they, they usually have a milder disease. And only ocular, vascular, and neurologic manifestations, and to some extent gastrointestinal manifestations, may have a poor prognosis, and the treatment is not standard. So the treatment should be adjusted according to patient's age, risk factors, and the severity of organ involvement. So depending on the, the extent of the disease, we don't use the same treatment principles for all manifestations. For example, mucocutaneous manifestations are usually mild manifestations, and they can be treated with colchicine or, 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 or dapson or thalidomide or, or even apremilase, we don't use anti-TNFs for the treatment of these patients. But I know in certain countries where the disease is not frequent, mucocutaneous manifestations are enough to make the diagnosis of HS. And for example, in the United States, most of the patients with bipolar aptosis are on anti-TNF treatment, which is unacceptable. So depending on, again, the severity of manifestations, going up to GI, ocular, and vascular, and neurologic manifestations, we start to use higher doses of steroids, if necessary, IV pulses, plus immunosuppressives, starting from azathioprine going up to cyclophosphamide. And for refractory cases, we are using anti-TNFs and interferon alpha. If we start with the, the most common manifestations, such as mucocutaneous manifestations, again, the risk is quite small, but it is usually associated with low uh, patient uh, high, uh, quality of life, and cochicine is the preferred treatment with, uh, along with uh, topical agents. But for refractory cases, steroids 
and azathaprine are quite helpful. And for difficult cases, you can also try thalidomide. But if it is really refractory, you can use interferon alpha and anti-TNN. And we have now two other options, apremilast and ustekinumab, which can be tried if possible. And for some uh, refractory skin manifestations, such as venous ulcers, it is really not necessary to use very strong immunosuppressives because they are usually sequela of the venous congestions. So triple compression bandages are, are usually the preferred treatment. Apremilas is recently uh, licensed for the treatment uh, after a very successful phase three. But I have to remind you that although it is a successful treatment, it's been tested on neural ulcers. But it was licensed as a treatment for Bechet's disease. Well, as I mentioned to you, it is helpful for mild manifestations, but possibly it will not be as effective as uh, for severe disease manifestations. And some open label trials for refractory oral ulcers showed the efficacy of ustekinumab, which is again uh, a biologic drug targeting P40 of IL-23 and IL-12, uh, but the usage of this drug is, is in a different way Three monthly injections are causing a milder suppression of the manifestations. It can be helpful for some oral manifestations, but not for all. Uveitis is possibly the, the most important disease manifestation. We use azathioprine plus minus cyclosporine plus corticosteroids for the treatment of uveitis. But if it is a very refractory, refractory to standard treatment, we use either interferon alpha or TNF-alpha inhibitors, especially monoclonal antibodies. Infliximab is our first choice, but recently adalimumab was shown to be effective in the treatment of uveitis. But in those trials showing the efficacy of adalimumab in, in uveitis, BHS patients constituted less than 7% of the patient groups. And most others are mild uveitis patients, and considering the severity of BHS uveitis, uh, adalimumab has a potential, but for very severe cases, infliximab is still our choice. And again, if you look at the efficacy parameters, it is helpful in the prevention of recurrences and preserving the ocular functions. It can be, again, uh, considered for the maintenance treatment or for milder cases, but for threatening uveitis or acute uveitis, infliximab is the best choice. And Regarding the toxicity, there are some issues. And TB is, of course, a problem in this part of the world, although in Turkey now, uh, the 20 in a 100,000 uh, prevalence rate for TB is considered the lowest prevalence rate. However, when we look at the uh, rheumatological conditions receiving uh, anti-TNF treatments, compared to rheumatoid arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, psoriatic arthritis, our BHSK patients had possibly four times higher risk of TB uh, with, with anti-TNF treatment, especially with infliximab, which is possibly associated with higher dose of glucocorticoid and immunosuppressive usage, and there might be some issues associated with genetic factors, but we need some additional treatments. So therefore, when possible, interferon alpha is providing a solution for them. And another advantage of interferon alpha is uh, the possibility of achieving remission is higher than anti-TNFs with interferon alpha. But there are still issues associated with interferon alpha as well. As a search for safer drugs, we first tried anti-IL-1s. Gevacuzumab was uh, the, the drug we used for the treatment of acute uveitis attacks in an open label trial, and it was shown to be effective for the treatment of acute uveitis when we use it IV. But during the phase three, sub-Q gevacuzumab was not successful in the prevention of recurrences. So there are some issues associated with the dosage and the, and the route of administration when you are using these biologic agents. And many papers, case reports, are describing favorable effects of other anti-IL-1 blockers, anakinra and kanakinumab, such as this one, several uh, case reports uh, showing some efficacy of anakinra or, or sub-Q uh, kanakinumab. In selected cases, you can try. Uh, 
but again, it is expensive, and for the severity of manifestations, the dosage and sub Q administration may not be enough. A similar issue was uh, the, the, the main problem we observed for the blockade of IL-17. Secukinumab was shown to be effective for the treatment of uveitis in a pilot trial when it was used 10 milligram per kilogram IV infusion, a single infusion. However, when it was tested as a sub-Q treatment for 300 milligram, it was not successful. So the trial was not a positive trial. But afterwards, just another study comparing the IV 10 and 30 milligram per kilogram sakikunumab with 300 sub-Q, it was successful. So higher doses in IV may be required for the treatment of hyperinflammatory lesions of VHS disease. And regarding vascular manifestations, there are several disputes. As I mentioned to you, thrombotic association is a very critical part of VHS vasculitis, and it's mainly associated with injuries to the vascular wall. So most of the thrombotic events are coming from endothelial injury, and presence of hypercoagulability may be an additive factor. So if you don't suppress the inflammation, endothelial activation, you cannot control the thrombotic tendency. We have several uh, analyses showing the efficacy of immunosuppressives in the management of uh, deep vein thrombosis in VHS patients. So in, in, in this multicenter cohort from Turkey showed that if the patients are on immunosuppressives, when you compare those with uh, patients using only anticoagulants, there are uh, critical differences. So the rate was significantly higher, the rate of recurrence was found to be significantly higher on those individuals taking anticoagulants, only anticoagulants. But there was no difference between those receiving immunosuppressives and those, pati and those patients receiving anticoagulants plus immunosuppressive. So there is no additional benefit of uh, using anticoagulants for the management of vein, uh, venous thrombosis. Therefore, during the recommendations, we suggested to use immunosuppressives plus glucocorticoids for the treatment of venous uh, thrombosis. However, there are debates, especially local guidelines are sometimes enforcing physicians to use anticoagulants, so our advice is Follow your local guidelines. Don't use anticoagulants alone. Please use immunosuppressives and corticosteroids. And depending on your local guidelines, you can consider adding anticoagulants, but don't use it alone. And if you will use anticoagulants, please search your patient for aneurysms. If there are arterial aneurysms, the fatal bleeding risk is quite high. So for refractory cases, again, anti-TNF and possibly anti-L1 may be an option. For arterial lesions, we are using, again, uh, immunosuppressives plus uh, corticosteroids. For pulmonary arterial lesions, the response is better than abdominal aortic aneurysms because of the intravascular pressure issue. So these are affecting the healing process. When there is high pressure area, the aneurysm is becoming bigger and bigger, and the size is quite a critical component for the treatment. But there are risks associated with surgery. And, and stenting as well. So there is an increased risk of thrombosis after stenting and grafting. Therefore, when possible, we are preferring ligation, ligation of the artery at all, or embolization for pulmonary arteries especially. So these are the preferred options compared to uh, stenting and grafting. Uh, for example, this is the patient I showed you with uh, the abdominal aortic aneurysms destroying the vertebral body. So that's the patient after all the standing events, and this is the vertebra which was really necessary to preserve the destroyed vertebral bodies in this patient. For GI involvement, the most critical issue is differential diagnosis with Crohn's. So in Crohn's disease, you can see uveitis, and different from spondyloarthritis in Crohn's disease, you can see intermediate uveitis as well, oral ulcers, even gentle ulcers, erythema nodosum, arthritis and, and GI lesions. So if you are not experienced with VHS disease, especially in countries where the disease is not prevalent, 
there are several Crohn's patients diagnosed with Bechet's disease. It's vice versa as well. So it is really critical to make the, uh, the correct differential diagnosis. So uveitis is quite helpful. And the presence of typical vascular neurologic manifestations and, and a positive pathology test may be helpful. For GI lesions, we use glucocorticoids when necessary, azathioprine, thalidomide, or, or 5-ASA, and infliximab and adalimumab are also effective in the treatment of uh, GI lesions. Arthritis and another issue, sorry, nervous system involvement, corticosteroids are the preferred choices. Immunosuppressives can be used. For refractory cases, uh, we can uh, use anti-TNFs. But one critical issue, you should avoid cyclosporin. So cyclosporin is a very effective treatment for uveitis, but cyclosporin is increasing the risk of parenchymal neurologic disease. So when there is any suspicion about parenchymal neurologic disease, cyclosporin should be avoided. Anti-IL-6, uh, because of the IL-6 involvement in neurologic involvement, we, it can be tried for severe neurologic disease, but there is an issue in those individuals taking anti-IL-6, the risk of uh, skin lesions is getting higher. So the anti-IL-6 uh, is somehow exacerbating skin manifestations in some patients. For arthritis, we can try colchicin, azathioprine, those low -low steroids, when necessary anti-TNFs or even interferon alpha, but usually arthritis is not uh, a critical issue. So when we look at all these manifestations and the treatment paradigm, we have lots of evidences showing the involvement of less IL-10, higher uh, TNF, uh, IL-17, uh, and IL-1. So we are using interferon alpha, which is associated with increased IL-1 receptor antagonists uh, and decreased IL-10 and IL-17, which is quite effective and has a remission potential higher than anti-TNFs. And monoclonal anti-TNFs are effective in almost all disease manifestations. And apremilas, which is a phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor, is associated with decreased TNF and increased IL-10 and again associated with a good response in mucocutaneous manifestations. And for refractory cases, IL-1, IL-12, IL-23 are still potential targets. So as a summary, I've tried to show you that it is a unique multifactorial disease, and it has distinctive features, especially if you concentrate on ocular, vascular, and parenchymal neurologic manifestations. It is strongly associated with HLA-B51, but we need additional polymorphisms, such as ERAP1 haplotypes and several other polymorphisms to define the clinical picture. Therefore, B51 is not a diagnostic test. And deregulated host-microbial interaction is defining the clinical picture. And with the treatment using different agents, depending on the patient's requirement, we aim to control acute exacerbation and to prevent recurrences. I want to finish by thanking my colleagues from uh, Istanbul University, Jarab Kosha Medical School, Koch University, and also especially to the NIH, NHGRI, Dan Kaster, and Inan Remmers, uh, who did uh, most of the GWAS work, and many international collaborators who provided samples for the GWAS studies. And again, thank you very much for the kind invitation. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ahmed, for this, as usual, nice update. And we have uh, time maybe for two, three questions. Dr. Musa. Thank you very much, Dr. Ahmed. For how long time do you use anticoagulation in patients with uh, vascular accidents in patients with Bajet disease? This is my first question. My second question, in your practice, did you see peripheral polyneuropathy due to vasculitis in Bajet patients? Well, I couldn't hear the second one. Did you see patients with peripheral polyneuropathy due to vasculitis? Okay, so for the first question, we don't use anticoagulants. So that's the clear message. But there are some using anticoagulants. For anticoagulants, the, the duration should be the standard duration for venous thrombosis between 6 to 12 months. But if you are using 
and effective immunosuppressive treatments, additional anticoagulants are not providing you additional help. So that's the message. We use anticoagulants only those patients who have no arterial aneurysms and who developed post-thrombotic syndrome, venous ulcers, venous congestion. So those, for those individuals, anticoagulants, and even necessary lifelong anticoagulants, are helpful to control venous stasis-associated skin problems. So for, for all others, follow your local guideline for deep vein thrombosis. Regarding polyneuropathy in Bechet's vasculitis, we don't see. So for small vessel disease, we observe it in ocular tissues, but it is not one of the small vessels disease associated with vasonervorum vasculitis. So polyneuropathy is not a sign of Bechet's disease. Okay, Dr. Leila. <clears throat> Thank you very much indeed, uh, Professor Gold. It is very interesting and very useful. Firstly, I would like to Can you raise your you, voice, please? Uh, yes, please. Uh, I would like to ask you about refractory oral ulcers. What do you suggest? Because there are many suggestions. And uh, I have patients who are resistant to all uh, these yeah. traditional uh, treatments or, or drugs. Uh, secondly, how do you do the bathergy test? Because some people suggest injecting saline. Is well, it well, subcutaneously or intradermally? And what do you consider the positive area? How many uh, millimeter? OK, for the first question for refractory oral ulcers, if the patient is refractory to colchicine, uh, we usually add low-dose steroids and azathioprine. It's usually effective. Talidomide is quite effective, but it is very hard to use talidomide for a long while, but it is an effective treatment option. Dermatologists are also using Dapson, but we don't have an experience with Dapson. But I don't know any patient refractory to steroid azathioprine combination. But when necessary, uh, for very severe cases, anti-TNF and interferon alpha may be another option. And when it's licensed, a premulas, although it is quite expensive, uh, may be another issue. And for the refractory oral ulcers, it is really necessary to look at the oral cavity. And the, the hygiene should be controlled. Uh, or better oral hygiene is uh, associated with a better management of oral manifestations. So those patients with uh, tooth problems, caries, infections, are strongly associated with worse oral manifestations. And the second question was pathergy test. Well, it is really a, a critical issue because the positivity uh, is decreasing without any known uh, reasons. Uh, the, the major critical issue is the trauma you're using. So originally, when we were using re-sterilized needles, although there was no contribution of microbial components, the needles were blunt. So it was easy to induce higher trauma. But nowadays, when you are using very uh, sharp uh, needles, if the, the, especially the needle is thin, the reaction, the positivity is getting less and less. So it should be a subcutaneous oblique insertion to the forearm, and the test should be read on the second day. Any erythematous induration is a positive reaction. Uh, we are using 20G, number one, yellow-headed needles. And to improve its sensitivity, we are working on some other triggers uh, to have a better response. It hasn't been published yet, but, but soon, I hope, I will be able to show you some new methods to induce pathogen reaction, which may produce probably a better sensitivity. Okay, thank you very much thank again, you. Dr. Ahmed.